Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to your name, Jesus. <laughs> oh, he's worthy this morning. He is worthy this morning. Hallelujah. I don't know how anybody could sit still <laughs> in the middle of praising our Lord. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm excited to see what God's going to do this morning. Ah. <laughs> Arms are wide open. <laughs> My spirit's wide open. You ever get to a point where you say, Lord, I don't care how it's going to turn out as long as you're in the middle of it. I don't know what's going to happen, but God, it's because of you being in the middle of it that I'm going to praise you. Mm. Surrendering to him totally. Giving him your all. When you don't know where or what to do, depending on the God that saved your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm excited this morning, and as we go to this word, I want to read over the scripture. But before I do that, I want to just petition his throne, if you'd come with me. Father, thank you for this morning that you have given us, Lord. It is because of you that we're here. It is because of you that you have granted us another day, Lord, of breath. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. Uh, Lord, this morning our prayer is that you will be glorified in everything that is said and done. Uh, Father, that our focus will be strictly on what the Holy Spirit gives to us. And Father, as I read through your word, Father, as we listen to what you have to say, Lord, Father, hide me behind your cross that you might be seen. Let my voice shrink and yours be loud. Uh, Father, may your words, Lord, penetrate hearts and minds and move them a little bit closer to you, Lord. In times of desperation, Lord, we don't know what to hold on to, but we know that if we hold on to your unchanging hand, that we'll be in the right place, that we'll have the comfort that we need, that we'll have the instruction that we desire. Lord, help us this morning. Speak to and through me, Lord. I lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read through uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 8 in the NIV. And it reads, his divine power has given us everything that we need for godly life through knowledge, through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. And that's where I want to camp. He has given us his great and precious promises. That's what he has done. So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having accepted the corruption of the world caused by evil desires for this very reason. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Today I want to try to cover what I've put down on paper, but of course you know I'm going to only give you what God has given me to give you, and if it's midway, if it's all the way, if it's just a few verses, I like to be led by the Holy Spirit of God in everything that I do and say because he has trusted me with his word. So this morning, I want to try to give to you our sovereign God. He keeps his promises. We have a sovereign God, but, 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 but he keeps 
his promises. I'm reminded of Exodus chapter 33, where Moses was going through the process and everyone had decided that they were going to do all kinds of crazy stuff against God, even though he had saved them out of Egypt, even though he had done all these great things. They decided in their own mind that I'm going to create this calf and I'm going to worship that instead of God. And God was angry with them, but Moses being the, the, the motivator that he is, being the innovator that he is, being the, the ambassador that he is, he went to bat for the Israelites. And he decided, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to God and ask him, please, Lord, have some mercy on these people. And it was because of that prayer that he prayed to God that God, in the midst of everything, decided, okay, I'm not going to take them out. Not totally. I'm reminded in the book of Genesis that in the beginning when the world was created, nothing happened until the Spirit of God moved. I'm reminded that when I'm in situations that I don't know exactly what to do, I fall on my knees and pray, and it's because of that prayer that things happen. It is because in the middle of trials, in the middle of struggles, that we find ourselves perplexed and not knowing exactly what to do. And this is the exact time that God wants us to be in the place where we can call on him and claim his promises that he will be with us and that he will never leave us. It's during those times that we, we, we remember Scripture and it falls into our spirit and, and, and we, we, we give Scripture back to the Lord, the ones that he's given to us to comfort us, and we say, Lord, you promised. You said you would do this. And it's during those times that, 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 that when we call on him and we say, Lord, you promise. It is during those times that when we are most prayerful, most humble, you see, prayer should not be the last thing in a 911 situation. Uh, prayer should be the first thing. You see, we shouldn't say, well, I've tried this, 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 and a third, but now I'm going to pray. Mm -mm. Prayer is the first responder. When you're hurting, prayer is the first responder. And it's the promises that God has given us to pray back to him. He tells us to read the word not as an antidote to get through the process of checking it off that I've read the word, but through the, the, through the process of understanding and, and getting it in your gut. So that when you, when you go back to the word that he brings to remembrance, when you're going through trials, it will comfort you. It's going to do what, it, what God said it would do depending on his promises and knowing that God is sovereign. I remember again going back to Exodus 33 and, and verse 19 where it says that, the, that, that God said, I will, have, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion because he's God all by himself. He, he is a sovereign Lord. He's going to do what he wants to do. That does not relieve you from doing what you're supposed to do. Hello. We still need to do what we're supposed to do. You see, he's not only a promise keeper, we made a promise to him as well. Lord, if you come into my life and change me, I'll obey your word. If you come into my life and, and, and do what you said you were going to, I will obey your word. But we fall short sometimes. But God is such a loving God that he comes through anyway. Even when we fail him, he comes through anyway. So today... The Lord not only offers us promises, but he offers us two types of promises. He offers us unconditional promises and conditional promises. Unconditional promises and conditional promises, yes. There are some conditions. You know, we are so used and accustomed to, to quoting uh, Second Chronicles during the last four years or so, for me anyway. I found myself going back to if my people. And I have to pause and stop there and go, okay, who is God talking to? He's talking to us, his people. He said, if my people who are called by my name, if you're called by his name, then you're his child because you see, if you're his kid, you hear his voice and he hears you and he understands you and he, he gives you direction. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, so apparently we're not being too humble these days. 
We're being quite prideful. And, you know, it's real easy to talk to Christian brothers and sisters about the Lord, but when it comes to talking to folks that are not smelling like us, looking like us, feeling like us, to talk to them about the Lord sometimes, I'm not saying or pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just saying that he wants us to be just as vigorous and just as powerful when witnessing to folks that don't know him as opposed to those who do. We preach more to ourselves than we do to anybody else. And let me tell you, that has nothing to do with the sermon that I'm giving this morning. This is Holy Spirit given. I'm just giving it to you because God said so. This morning, this morning, as we, as we ponder the conditional and unconditional promises, one thing I do know is that there are five unconditional promises that he gives us. Mm. First, let's state the theological, okay, of the promise. This is the theological background and the understanding of what, what it means. Theologically speaking, uh, God keeps his promise. Yeah. Now, we could break that up in Greek and Hebrew and all of that, but the bottom line is the theological way of looking at it is that God keeps his promise. So let's first establish that. He doesn't fall back on his promises. If he said it, he's going to do it. He's not a man. He can't lie. It's impossible. So if he said it, he's going to do it. Now, it may not come out the same way you'd want it to. It may come out a little bit different. But God is sure to come through. So this is what I know for sure, that there are at least five unconditional promises that we can all claim. Number one, God is always with me. He's always with me, which means he's always with you. That's a promise that we can hold on to. God is always with me. And by him being with me all the time, I will not fear. Mm. If he's with you all the time, you have no reason at all to fear. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart for real, and lean not on your own understanding to get confused and trust them in everything, then you won't have that fear. See, fear comes from the unknown of not knowing, but when we have a God that knows everything, hello, and because we're his kids and he knows everything, we can rely on him. Stop spending time on stuff that you haven't purchased. We're putting more time and effort into things that we don't own. You can't change some situations. Listen, COVID and all of its different variances, you can't change that. But you can trust in God. Now, he does say that I would not have you to be ignorant, my dear brother. In other words, do some study, check yourself out, check out your relationship with him, check out your relationship with others, do the work. That's what he's saying. Now, I can listen to Dr. X and Dr. Z, but when it all comes down at the end of the day, it's God. It's all God. Scientists can only do what they can do. Doctors are practitioners. Hello. Everybody didn't get an A. They're practicing. They have not arrived. Neither have we. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. That's what he says. So one of the promises I know for sure is that God is always with me. And as a result of that, I will not Isaiah 41 and 10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's what the Word says. He said that he will be there. He confirms it also in Deuteronomy 31 and 6 and also Zephaniah 3 and 17. He confirms that. In Romans 8, 39, 38 through 39, he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He will be with us in every situation. He never promised that he would take you out, but if he does, praise God, And if he doesn't, praise God, wherever he has you. I heard a preacher say once, God is either taking you out of something, allowing you to go into something, 
and he's with you even if you're in the middle of something. So we're either going to, we're in the middle of it, or we're coming out, but God is constant. He will be there. So there is no reason to fear. Matthew 28, 20 says, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always. How long? Till the very end of the age. How long is he going to be with us? Forever. Say it with me. How long? One more time. Forever. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that. Lord, you promised You promised that when I'm going through this illness, you're going to be there. You promised that when cancer hit, you were going to be there. You promised that when when I went into ICU, you would be there. You promised that when I went down this street and saw craziness, you'd be there. You promised that even if I was at a red light and people ran ran it, you would be there. You promised you would be with me. So because you're with me, I'm not going to have any fear. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that's something to shout about. God is there. All the time. He's with you. That's one thing I do know. The second promise that I know is that God is always in control. He is always in control. It's real easy to think that you have some control. (laughs) But sometimes we find out real quick, fast, in a hurry that we really don't have the control we think we have. Let somebody do something to your family. See how much control you have. It'll make you talk funny. See how much control you have when you're at a, at a stoplight and a car goes past. <laughs> See how much control you have. See how much control you have over your body when your child says something and you knew it was out of line. You have to, you know, <laughs> got to bring it in. We don't always have the control that we think. You know what I've learned? I've learned this. I've learned that that, that, uh, uh, I watch a lot of nature channels. And uh, there was this one episode where they were showing how to catch these particular types of monkeys. And they would put a jar uh, out there uh, that was pretty heavy. And inside the jar, they would put the treat that the monkey loves. And it, it, it sent out an aroma that the monkey knew it was there. So he would reach in and he would grab all that was in there. And then they would come running towards him. The monkey would not release what he had. And because his fist was balled up, he couldn't get it out of that heavy jar. So he was running with this jar, trying to get away from the person that was catching him. And they caught him. See, the monkey didn't realize that if he had only released what he thought he had control over, what he thought he wanted, he would have dropped his hand and that heavy little vase would have disappeared and he would have been able to get away. You see, you gain control by relinquishing it. Hello. You gain control by relinquishing it. You keep holding on to stuff that has you bound. That's why Satan keep catching up with you. <laughs> you run and say, get away from me, Satan. Get it. God is saying, release that and give it to me. I told you to carry all your troubles to me. He said, release it and get it. We don't really, we keep holding on to it. Satan catches up with us and goes, ha ha, got you. Then, you know, Satan like he is, <laughs> he tells you how he caught you. He explains things to you that you already knew. Much like I'm doing today, I'm just giving you stuff that you already know. God is always in control. And because he's in control, I will not doubt. Many are the plans of men in man's heart, right? But the the Lord's purpose is that he prevails. That's the purpose. He is is before all things, and in him all things prevail. Hold together, Colossians 1.17. All things hold together. That means even us. Hello, you ever been at the edge, felt like you were going to fall apart? Who's holding you together? God. You ever at your wit's end, don't know what to do? Who's holding you together? God. He holds everything together. You know, it seems like there's been more illness 
in these past two years than I have ever seen before in my life. And perhaps it's because it's more illnesses of friends and close relatives, and my prayer list is getting longer and longer. You can't just sit and just pray. Some things you have to labor over. Some things you, you have to just trust God in. I'm not exactly sure why God allows certain things to happen, but I know that he is a God who is in control of everything, and because of that, I won't doubt. I refuse to doubt. As a matter of fact, the uh, book of James tells us that uh, uh, when you pray, pray believing. Because the man that prays without believing, the man that prays doubting, it's like, it's like the wave of a ship tossed to and fro, unstable in all of his ways. You gotta pray believing. What does that mean? That means to pray with confidence. Pray with anticipation. Pray knowing that God's promises will come through. Pray believing that this sovereign God will answer you. Don't get wrapped up in how he's going to do it. Get wrapped up in the fact that he is God and you're not. And because of that, you should have that confidence of believing that God will and don't doubt. That's one thing I do know. A third promise is that God is always good. <laughs> God is always, always good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him, uh, Psalms 34 and 8. Take refuge in God. Take refuge in him. What does that mean to take refuge? It means that when you are in the midst of all kinds of things that you cannot control, when you're being attacked from all sides, take refuge in God because he will fight your battle. I'm recalling in, 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 in uh, Chronicles where, where he said, this battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. God will do something amazing when you cast all of your cares on him. He will do something incredible once you give it and release it all over to him. He will come through. Trust his promises. Trust his promises. He is always good. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalms 105, that's what it says. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for that is pleasant. Psalms 135 and 3. That's one thing I do know. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, someone said to Jesus, good, 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 good teacher. He said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Why do you call me good? Did he have an answer for him? What was his answer? <laughs> he was God. He was God. He received that. God is good. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all good. They're not individual gods, individual deities. One God, three, well, I'm getting into something else there, right? <laughs> One God, three persons. They're all good. They're all good. That's the one thing I do know. Fourth promise is God is always watching. He's always watching. He's checking you out when you're doing the great things, and he's checking you out when you're doing not so great things. <laughs> the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. It's beholding both of those. God is always Watching, for your ways are full in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. Proverbs 5.21. Let me read that again. For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. Proverbs 5.21. He examines all your paths. So whichever way you go, He's not only checking it out, but he's examining it. Why is he examining it? So he can tell you, uh, 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 you don't want to go down that way. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I know it sounds good, looks good. It ain't good. You know, people say, well, anything in moderation is good. Well, if I took a little poison, 
I'm still going to die, even in moderation. Some things God has to say, okay, just don't do that. Don't do that. Sometimes he'll say, okay, this is the path you need to take, but not right now. Hold on. Wait a minute. I got you. Just give me a little time to orchestrate it for you so that when you get there, you'll be ready for it. But see, we want it right now. I want it now. I want it now. What was that commercial? I want it now. It's my money. I want it now. Right? Right? You want it now. <laughs> but the reality is you're not prepared to receive everything right away. God sometimes has to stretch us to the point where we can envelop the blessing. See, if he doesn't stretch you, your blessing will fall right on the side. So sometimes we've got to be stretched to the point where we can actually receive it. God wants to guide us to where we're going to be most happy. Happy is the man. Blessed is the man. He wants us there. He is always, always watching. How long for a month gone, a month gone by, for the days when God watches over me, Job 29 and 2. The Lord said to me, I have seen correctly, for I am watching to see my word is fulfilled. That's Jeremiah 1.12. He's watching to see that his word is fulfilled. So, so, so this is the thing. If you don't know his word, you can't fulfill it, can you? So again, it goes back to what? Timothy, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed of the gospel, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Whenever I quote that, I always give a caveat. It's that rightly divided the word, right? The caveat is if it's wrongly divided, <laughs> chances are you won't get to where you need to be. You know, there are some conditional promises. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Then what? He'll direct your path. So if you're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart and leaning on him with all your understanding, chances are you won't get that. <laughs> you see, there's a condition to that. I haven't gotten to conditional ones yet. Fifth, God is always victorious. God is always victorious. And because of that, I will not fail and neither will you. He is always, always, always victorious. God is strong and always victorious. Both deceive and deceivers are in his power. You need to let that resonate for a minute. Both deceived and deceivers are in his power. That's what, that's what comes from Job 12 and 16. So those who are deceived and those who are deceivers, both are in his power. The deceiver is in his power, yes. Yes. And the person that's being, yes, he's in his power too. Why does God, you know, allow this bad stuff? Uh, be, because he's sovereign. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have comfort on whom I will have comfort, because I am God. No one can stay my hand. I am God all by myself. You can't change me. I'm the one that caused the rain to fall and the, and the rivers to flow. I am God all by myself. He is the one that pressed down his hand in the middle of earth and mountains came up. That's what it says. He is God all by himself. He does what he wants, whenever he wants, to whomever he wants, and however he wants to do it, because he's God. When you create a thing, you become the thing's God, right? If I molded some clay together and I didn't like the way that clay looked, I can go and make something over. God created us. He molded us in a way, and he didn't like what he said. So he, took, he said, you know what? I'm going to destroy this business. And the rains came, the floods came, the ship rose, and everyone that was left died. He said, oh, well, you start that over. Because he's God. But God is not just a God that says, I have authority. He's a God of love because after he did this, he turned around and said, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky to let you know that my covenant and my promise will stand. I will never do this again. Now, parents with kids, sometimes we tell the kids, 
I'll never do that again to you. Sometimes we believe that that means everything. No, if you mess up, he's going to do something else to you. <laughs> you know, he's going to do something else to you. I'm, I'm just saying, you have a responsibility to do the right thing. You can't just say, you put everything under that, under that, you know, that umbrella of, well, well God said he, he, he's got me. He, he gonna, well, I, may, maybe I should be, you know, maybe he'll forgive me if I just, you know. You know, if you deliberately sin, God sees that deliberately, and then try to pull out, you know, pull out the I'm covered by grace card. You know, oh, you got to be, you got to be clear on what this word is actually saying. You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that, that, that if you have the Lord in you, if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not practice sin. Hear me. If you have a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit resides in you, you will not practice sin. You won't do this deliberately over and over and over again and pull out your grace card. Because that don't work. If you're practicing sin, chances are you may not have a relationship. That's just what the Bible says. I'm sorry. It's possible. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying it's possible. Look at the possibility. If I'm continuing to sin, then, then that which is in me probably is not in me. Maybe I just think it's in me. Maybe I've gone to church and got a membership and I have a card with a number on it. Maybe. Maybe I've uh, said the sinner's prayer and, you know, I've said it 18 times now, so I've got 18 salvation notches on my gun, which means I've got 18 grace cards. Right? It's not in just saying something. It's not just in being a member of something. You need to be a member of God's family, not a member of a church. Now, I'm not, I might get in trouble with that. <laughs> you, see, you, you see, church is in you. We're commanded to assemble ourselves together for edification purposes, for education purposes, to learn what we need to do in this word because there are people at different levels. So we learn here. But our objective is not to just come here, soak up all this good word, eat all this good word, and then go out fat and don't give it to nobody. You can't get full up on this word and get full up on this knowledge and, and don't do nothing with it. God calls us to hand that stuff out. That's why there should be more, you know, preachers not just sitting but going hello if i'm standing in line waiting on my turn and it's 25 of y'all in here <laughs> my turn may not come for five years i need to take my turn somewhere else if it's in you it's gonna come out if god has placed something in you it's gonna come out if it's not coming out chances are it's not in you i'm just saying god is always victorious let me get off of that <laughs> God is strong and always victorious. Both the deceiver and the deceived are in his power. But thanks be to God, he has given us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have him as your Lord and Savior, he's given you the victory that you need to get through all of these things. Ye are of God, ye are of God, little children. This is what it says in 1 John 4, 4, King James Version. Ye are of God, little children and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We've heard that since we said yes to Christ. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. What does that mean? That means that the one that is in you, the Holy Spirit that you possess is in you, is greater than he that is outside in the world. The deceiver is outside in the world. Evil is outside the world. Satan is outside the world. The person that is in you, that Holy Spirit, is more powerful than Satan. Yeah. You have and possess the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. You, if you said yes to Christ, possess everything that Jesus had that rose him from the dead. You possess that. Ah, you don't believe me. See, 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 if you believe that, when things came your way, you can call on those things and say, you know what, I'm not receiving that. 
in Jesus' name. I'm not receiving that. Some things you just have to push away. But you got to believe that you're victorious. If you don't believe that you're victorious, chances are you might fail. So you got to trust that God is the victor. He is the one. Let me, because let me, my time is running, and no, I will not be able to go through all that I have here, but I do want to tell you this. Uh, those five promises I do know, and they're unconditional. There are some conditional promises out there that uh, you have to do a particular thing in order for things to happen. Humbling yourselves is one. Talking to the Lord is another. Seeking his face is another. Obeying his word is another. And you'll get what he said he promised. You've got to believe in his promises. I'm going to tell you a... Uh, personal thing that happened to my wife and I, if I can share this, Dr. Syfax, I can say, okay, thank you, because uh, <laughs> I didn't get her permission ahead of time, uh, <laughs> but there were, there were some things that happened with my wife, and, and, and you guys are all familiar with this, but I just want to show you how God was so sovereign in what took place, and it was because of the fact that we held on to his promises. I really, really believe that. I tell you, the first, the first scripture that came to mind when my wife was in ICU was, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, Isaiah 41.10. So I had to go in there without the fear. Now, I had a healthy amount of concern, <laughs> but it was without fear. Let me tell you what happened. We were planning to go to Chicago, and we thought it'll be so cool if we didn't have to drive through the traffic, so we're going to take the train. So we had this train uh, set up for about 8 o'clock in the morning or so. Uh, my wife got up around you know, a little before 5, and uh, she, she went to the, to, to the bathroom, and, and she called out my name, Arnold. And, and I said, what's going on? She said, there's blood all in the toilet and stool. And I thought, oh, wow. I said, how do you feel? And she said, I, I feel dizzy. And then immediately after that, she said, dial 911. And I dialed 911, of course. I was, I was in the process. This is interesting, the timing itself. Eight o'clock was our train, and, 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 and five o'clock, a little after five, she was in emergency. Ambulance had come and gotten her to emergency. That's another one. Talk about the sovereignty of how God arranges things. The timing was great because if it had happened around 8.05, we would have been on a train. But it didn't happen then. It happened before then. As a matter of fact, even while she was there and she was trying to figure out, okay, maybe we'll still have time to catch the, catch the train. So she's asking the doctor, okay, how long is this going to last? And, and uh, he said, uh, you're, you have internal bleeding. It's, it's pushing things out. And so, of course, that was a shock to us that, okay, how long is this going to be? So that, that kind of threw us for a loop. And the doctors were saying, uh, we're going to have to give you blood to replace the blood that you're losing. We're going to give you two units of blood to, to do this. Meanwhile, they're still checking and everything, but God's timing was perfect. The location was perfect. We live about five minutes away from the hospital. Uh, we didn't, we, I could have drove, uh, but because we called the ambulance, they were able to give her fluids right away, which was able to uh, bring her blood pressure up because her blood pressure was dry, dro dropping a little bit, causing her to be a little di uh, dizzy. So, so that was a God-arranged thing, being inside an ambulance that we didn't need to call because it's only five minutes away, but her thinking was, I'm feeling dizzy. If I'm going to need something, they're going to have it. <laughs> so having an ambulance, take it, the location, the hospital's five minutes away. God was in the middle of that. The doctors that were there, you had some experts in these particular areas that she had to see as she was going through this process. These folks, and of course, I started researching who they were. I don't know about you, but I checked people out, and, and maybe because I'm not as trusting as some of you are, uh, I'll get their name, and sometimes I'll even take a picture. I have a picture of one of the doctors, 
of his ID and everything. Who are you? What do you do? What are you planning on doing? You know, I look them up, I Google them and find out, and some of these folks were world renowned, had no idea. But the doctors that worked on her were experts in the field. That's a sovereign thing. I put out a prayer. As a matter of fact, in, in the ambulance, I believe it was, she put out a, a call or a text to her sisters, and they started praying, and they have this network of prayer warriors. I put out uh, a call to a few people saying, okay, only one prayer. Stop the bleeding. It was my only prayer. Stop the bleeding. She ended up going through two transfusions, two near-death situations because her pressure had dropped so low it was like 59 over 36 or something like that uh when your pressure drops that low i found and discovered that your body goes into shock things start shutting down you know like your your heart your lungs all that kind of stuff starts shutting down so they got it back up this is the beauty i kept thinking about so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. I wasn't nervous, and she most certainly wasn't nervous. People, the doctors were amazed at how calm she was. As a matter of fact, when all of this stuff was going on, there was one person that came in and said, well, I know you're scared, and she stopped them in their tracks. No, I'm not, and you need to leave with that business. <coughs> you know, some, some people, you have to just move out of your way that comes with those negative, you know, things. I know you're scared. You're going to be terrified. You're going to be, no, 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 I don't receive any of that. You need to move around. And sometimes you just need to move people around that's, that's speaking that kind of stuff into your spirit. Anyway, 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 my time is running. But I, I thought this was a great example to show how sovereign God was and how he is in the middle of everything that transpires. He's there doing the good, during the bad, during the indifferent, I've got friends that I'm praying for that are going through. I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm trusting him. And I'm not, I'm not fearing. I am trusting God. Situations don't change without prayer. Situations don't change without prayer. Prayer is the first responder. I think back to Jehoshaphat when he was fearful of things happening. And like I said earlier, he didn't know if he was going to be able to take this war on or, or win against these people that were coming up against him. God told him, chill. You just need to chill. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when God finished talking to him, folks were singing. And the singing, you know, he put a choir out there, right? So the choir, hey, there's something to be said about musicians and singers and praising God in song. Y'all just need to hear this. Sometimes that will fight the fight before you even get to the fight. But you got to get there. <laughs> you got to get there. So by the time Jehoshaphat got there, it was over. These folks had taken out each other. So I guess, in essence, I want to leave you with this. God's promises are sure. He is a sovereign God. God is always with us. God is always in control. God is always good. God is always watching. And God is always, always victorious. And perhaps you don't know him today. And I want to give you the opportunity to say yes. I want to give you the opportunity to know who this victorious God is. You see, during the time of this COVID-19 and all of its variances, uh, during the time of cars that are running red lights and hitting folks and killing them, uh, during the time where things are happening that are unprecedented, during the time where we don't have the antidote, God is. God is. 
He's the one that can actually take care of those things. Now, am I saying it's going to be perfect? No. But I am saying that it will be taken care of. He promised that he would be with you. He promised that he wouldn't leave you. He promised that he would come into you. There is a condition. God is a gentleman. He will not force you to do anything, nor does he want robots. God gives us this wonderful thing called choice. He gives us an opportunity to say yes to him or to reject him. If you reject him and you die, there is a hell and you will enter it. People don't want to talk about hell. They want to talk about love. Love is great. Love is what God offers. He offers an unconditional love. That's why he gave his son Jesus. Jesus came that we might have life through him. So if you don't know him, recognize your condition. This is your condition. The Bible says we're, we've all sinned and fallen and, you, you know, we're not good people. People say, oh, well, everybody's generally good. No, everybody's generally bad. Generally. Now, I know you don't want to hear that. But this is the thing. <laughs> Hell is real, and if you don't believe it, it doesn't change the reality of it. Heaven is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. And it doesn't make a difference how much you believe or don't believe in it. it it's still there. This air in this room however tainted it is because of, the, because of virus and all that, it's real. And if you don't have it, you die. The Bible says that we have all fallen short. The Bible says that Jesus came that we might have life, right? He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He carried it on further. He said, there is, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He makes it real clear. Because he knew somebody was going to say, what about others? Neither is there salvation in the other. Salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. Well, that's kind of narrow. Yeah, it is. He said that if you accept him into your heart, that soul that believes, that soul that receives, will be heaven bound. And it's not just heaven bound. Your life changes. He asks you to do one thing. Receive him for who he is. But here's the condition. Repent. Repentance, I learned a long time ago, there's two words, metamelonia and metanoia. Metamelonia is I'm sorry, metanoia is a turnaround, a repentance. Metanoia means I'm going in one direction, I stop, and I turn, and I go in the other direction with no intention of ever going back. That's repentance. Repent. Say, Lord, forgive me, wash me, clean me. Come into my heart and change me. And just like that, no lightning bolt, no flips down the center of the aisle. Just like that. Intellectual decision that results in a heart transplant and a changed life. Today, if that's you, pray with me something like this. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm lost. I recognize that you're the Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me and wash me of my sins. Come into my life and change me. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And just like that, if you've made that decision, you can go on our website at uh, www.newtchurch.org and you can uh, uh, call me or any of the people that are listed on our bulletin and tell them, okay, I've made this commitment to Christ. I think it's important. The most important part, I believe, of any sermon, sermonette, is the invitation that you will get your life in line with God, especially right now. It's not only going to help you, it's going to help generation after generation after generation. So with that, if you'll stand with me, amen. Thank God. His promises are true. 
He's a sovereign God. His word will stand forever. Amen and amen. I'll give you the benediction if you just stretch your hands to the air. Yeva Redeka Erenai Ereis Yereka Yae Erenai Pana Eleka Lechsin Eleka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.